So I know some of you have heard me speak uh, before um, about resilience and uh, over the last uh, year, really. Um, so I'm just wondering, can you see the screen? But I'm just not on. We can yeah, see. if you yeah, just presentation mode and then we're good. Yeah, I'll just go up to slideshow here. Yeah. Um, there we go. From beginning, great. Okay, everybody. Well, I suppose, I mean, we've spoken, I think, at least once or twice about this, uh, this whole area of resilience and mental health uh, over the last year, and certainly uh, a topic that's um, preoccupying us here in more ways than one in the hospital. Um, but for, I suppose, us all in general, uh, that idea about keeping ourselves steady uh, is really important at the moment. And I'm glad to hear that there's a lot more in the media at the moment about uh, our mental health in terms of the impact of COVID. Because really, I think at the start of all of this, we, uh, I think it's been quite a roller coaster ride. Um, and there's been a lot of adrenaline fueled emotions, whether that's been fear, uh, but also I think excitement. I think certainly that was part of that kind of uh, gathering our resources and uh, mobilizing ourselves was all very much part, I think of the early, um, the early months of this crisis. Now I think there's more of a sense of weariness. Um, certainly, we're picking that up here in the hospital, um, and I think we're, I think it's it's a consensus among uh, many of us at the moment that sense of when will this end. So I just want to talk talk a little bit about homeostasis, which is really a biological term, and what 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 is that about? It's about really the fact that we all need to maintain a reliable internal state, um, and that we need that to maintain this despite changes in the world outside. And we all need to do it, every living organism, from plants to puppies to people, we all need it because it's about regulating our internal environment and in order to, and then in, in doing so, we can process energy and survive. And that's really what mental health and regulation um, and keeping ourselves steady is all about. So this is one of my favorite people at the moment. This is Dan Siegel, he's a psychiatrist uh, based in Stanford. And um, he talks a lot about what's called interpersonal neurobiology, really interesting stuff around the neuroscience of connection and connectivity and the importance of mindfulness. Um, and what he talks about is there's fundamentals in terms of our regulating of ourselves, resilience, our maintaining our mental health. And there's four needs we have to be seen, to feel safe, to be soothed and to uh, feel secure in ourselves. So just a little bit of a review in terms of what stress is. And I know we've, we've talked a lot about it on this forum in the past, but stress is really, it's our body's reaction to change and threat. And it's a very effective system. And it's kept us around uh, for many thousands of years um, as a species. And because what our bodies do, they're acutely good at mobilizing uh, in terms of challenge or threat. So either we confront challenge as in fighting it, or we actually run away or get away from it, which is our flight response. And both these responses are really designed to help us push through difficult situations to tolerate adversity and to work through it. But what we always have to remember, and this is coming back to this idea of homeostasis, is that we always have to uh, return to our resting state. That's really important in terms of maintaining our, you know, surviving, we need to get back to our resting state after a challenge or a stressful situation. But where a challenge persists over time and it doesn't happen, we've become exhausted. And we could, I guess all of us can feel that a little bit at the moment in terms of the long uh, longevity of, of this particular um, current pandemic. They all, it's also really important to remember that when threat is not something that we can face or escape, there is another uh, system in our body, which is our free system, which can also kick in. And that's if we can't escape from something or face it. And again, some of us, and certainly it's in the media at the moment around fe people feeling that maybe a sense of numbness a little bit at times or detached from things. And again, that's a very normal response within the sense of, of the longevity of this current crisis that we're, we're all experiencing. So maybe just to talk a little bit more about traumatic stress, because I would say right now, I would diagnose everybody on this webinar with me as having a little bit of traumatic stress in their lives right now. Um, 
And it's about the idea of being exposed to a traumatic event and, and the, um, I suppose, the in, incredible situation we find ourselves in. But just uh, remembering that actually um, it's a normal response uh, to an abnormal event um, and that what can help in this situation, early support and social connection are really, really important. And it's something that we saw here in the hospital uh, earlier in uh, 2020, when we really had to mobilize our, our staff support systems. It's good, good to say that most people do recover from traumatic stress um, it, because it tends, you know, we are at our heart resilient beings. And it can also be an opportunity for positive change and growth also. Um, and this is the idea of post-traumatic growth. Um, the idea of if we, we can give ourselves a helping hand and we can help others. I'm very conscious tonight that a lot of us aren't in that phase yet. And, and it may be a while before we can really think about post-traumatic growth and what we've learned or the positive experiences we've had as a result of this um, adversity in our lives. But it's worth thinking about right now because I think if we can think about it, it gives us a sense of optimism. Um, and uh, positive um, and post-traumatic growth is something that's um, really about people having to contend with significant moral or traumatic events. Um, and then as it was in the aftermath of that, uh, experiencing a degree of post uh, or positive personal change as a result of that adversity. So in the aftermath, uh, what, what has been left behind or what has been gained in this situation? So what it often is about is the bolstering of psychological resilience that through adversity and we may learn more resilience, we may learn things about ourselves we, we didn't know, we may improve our self-esteem, uh, we can maybe change our outlooks and values um, uh, in the aftermath of a highly ch challenging situation. But at the same time, that's why I think it's really important to emphasize right now, because I think a lot of us don't feel like we're in that phase yet of post-traumatic growth. It's not about minimizing loss or pain. This isn't an either or situation. Um, um, but it is about the idea that this could be po the possibilities, I suppose, is, is what I'm asking people to consider for themselves um, during this time and what might be possible in the future. So the concept of it is back to around 2004, there was a seminal article um, from uh, the psychologists about it that really um, uh, wasn't new because we all know, and I mean, it's, it's back through eons of time, the idea of wisdom being, you know, with suffering can come wisdom, can come renewal, can come growth. Um, but the idea of post-traumatic growth has really grown since the early noughties. And it's about, as I said, discovering personal strengths and um, perhaps uh, relationships being enhanced as a result of adversity, discovering, as I said, new possibilities, a new appreciation of life, and for some people, uh, spiritual changes too. And it, it relies on a, a different elements, really. Um, it relies on education, the idea of um, thinking about the situation you've found yourself in, that's adversity, uh, what it has meant for you. Uh, disclosure is interesting because the evidence would, would suggest that where we disclose, where we share our suffering with others and, and you know, share our stories, um, it can be that idea of common humanity. Um, it can be very effective too in helping us move forward and gain some personal positive growth from the situation. The idea of service is interesting as well. And again, the evidence would suggest that where people have a sense of service, uh, a sense of uh, meaning in their lives, um, that that again can be really helpful in terms of uh, finding that, that sense of, of growth. And uh, narrative development is about our own stories. It's about uh, how, you know, what, what is the meaning of, of this experience, this lived experience to me in, in a very personal way. Um, and every, all of us have our own individual narrative, our own individual story about uh, the meaning of, of this uh, current situation, this current crisis for ourselves. Emotional regulation is really what we're talking about. It's around that staying steady and trying to maintain ourselves in, in this situation. So how can we calm ourselves? Um, some days it's easier to do than others. 
But what we do know, and it's, it's, we're seeing it more and more in physical health um, and medicine now, is the idea of the mind-body connection. Um, the idea that we can't regulate our mental health without regulating our body. And um, so it does start with our bodies. And that's everything from breath to posture to uh, just a sense of what we call embodied mentalization. The idea that we can think about ourselves within our bodies. We've got to know our bodies and um, our aches and pains, our, our, our strengths, our weaknesses. So that's a, that's a good place to start. Uh, I, I put this slide up, and I don't know if I've talked about it with the IHS before, but this is uh, Alex Honnold, who this is a brilliant documentary called Free Solo that I think is on Netflix at the moment. And it's about his, um, he's a, a free climber. Attention and uh, the sense of keeping ourselves in the present and very focused uh, can really be an incredible skill that we can all maybe not do it to the, to the extent that uh, Alex Honnold can do it, but um, our capacity to use our, our, um, our, our mental capacities to keep us focused and to keep us safe can be quite extraordinary at times. It's a, it's a scary movie to watch, but it's also quite exhilarating, so I'd recommend it if people are looking for a Netflix recommendation this weekend. Um, the idea also of what we call present awareness. So this is where mindfulness-based practices has really taken off in terms of, you know, it's an old Buddhist practice, thousands of years old. But the idea, and particularly in mental health now, that we can all use mindfulness, and it doesn't have to be, sometimes people think I have to sit for half an hour in a quiet space and, and have absolute quiet and focus in and meditate. Mindfulness isn't necessarily about meditation at all. It's about actually just developing that sense of present awareness. And you can do it in all sorts of ways, whether it's climbing El Capitan or going for a walk or indeed just uh, going out into the garden, whatever way. And there's all there's amazing resources now around mindfulness that, that, that we would say uh, is really important. So this idea of developing a sense of present awareness, why is it so important? Well, what we do know, and again, the neuroscience is pointing in this direction, it's really interesting, is that conscious awareness of our experience in the present moment, and that's really important, enables us to perceive more accurately what is happening around us. So our, our senses become more heightened if we can keep ourselves in the present moment. And in doing so, uh, not only can that uh, calm our arousal systems, calm our fight flight uh, response. It can also activate, if we're in that freeze response, it can also activate, uh, activate our social engagement systems as well. So it's a, it's a skill that's really useful in terms of, of regulating ourselves. It also allows us to engage fully in what we're actually doing right now. Um, and that idea of mindfulness, whether it's mindfulness of practice of, you know, you can do mindfulness when you're ironing, you can do mindfulness in all sorts of different ways. It doesn't have to be, as I said, this, idea of sitting zen-like in, in a corner of the room. It also, present awareness also gives us really important information about whether to change or persist in our behavior. So that idea of our gut feeling and is this working for me? So it's very much um, focused on, our, am I going in the right direction? Am I going to what we call our towards move to where, where we wanna go in our lives? So it's also important, I keep banging on about this at the moment, I think to lots of people, certainly to lots of patients here, is that the whole area of media exposure, I think at the moment, um, is so important and how we manage our media exposure, because I think this pandemic, uh, I think we are so inundated with information, whether it's on our phones, on our laptops, on the radio, on the television, and it's so important to manage it, because again, the evidence would say, and they saw this with them, um, Certainly when they're back and looked at, the, at, the, at SARS, they saw exactly the same thing then and they expect it now with COVID that really, we really need to manage our, um, our, our media exposure. So the most important things to start are at our own beginning. I talked earlier about the idea of stories um, and that we all have our own personal story. And there's, there's no right or wrong way to begin in terms of managing our mental health and um, regulating ourselves. Um, it, it is though to know that we need to keep ourselves steady by establishing some sort of safety. 
um, wherever that might be. Um, because what we do know is that, you know, again, the neuroscience would say that unless we feel safe, we can't engage socially, we can't mentalize, we can't problem solve, we need to, our frontal lobes go offline if we don't feel safe, or that because what's happening is our stress response is activated. So using your breath to anchor your feelings as well is really important. And recognizing what's happening to you, looking at your body and feeling what's happening in your body and um, where you're feeling your anxiety is so important too. Also, there's lots of people journaling at the moment, looking at um, you know, what, has what has helped them in the past in terms of uncertainty and what they can do right now. Um, the idea of uh, also um, investing time in what's important to us, looking at not so much what makes us happy, but what, what gives us meaning in, the, in life right now? Um, what am I contributing? Um, do I feel connected with other people? All those are the, are the important questions. And are we on track in terms of what we're doing, in terms of how we're living our lives? So focusing our energies, we know that stress can be very demanding in terms of our energies. Uh, it can, and we often, when we're stressed, we can find that we are trying to focus on too much at the same time. So we need to focus in, learn to harness and set clear and achievable goals and is very much key to mental health. Just that sense of autonomy. Committed action, looking at our values, where we want to go in our lives, even if we can't go very far at the moment, really important. Looking at what our, our, our behaviours are, are we living our behaviours? Are they, are they consistent with what we're valuing in our lives and where we want to go. Forward planning, even if it's small things at the moment, it's really important to make short, small plans at the moment to keep ourselves going. Being conscious of your inner critic, we all need it, but making sure you're questioning, am I being harsh with myself or am I being more self-compassionate? And it's something that, again, a skill that we really need to develop. And using our mistakes as learning opportunities, so important. Um, it's how we grow as well. So thank you for listening. And I think there, there may be questions. Thanks.